Well, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us for this month's Fiduciary 15 webinar. You know, as you know, we want to talk a little bit about some lessons we can learn from ongoing litigation. And the nice thing about this for most of you, if not all of you, is that you're not currently involved in this litigation. So you're not currently facing the same type of risk that those who are in the litigation are facing. But it really gives us the opportunity to dive in and look at the claims, the complaints that are being filed by the plaintiffs, having a good understanding of how the courts are handling those. And what you're going to see is that the answers, the responses, the court's approaches are all over the map. And so on the one hand, this could all be somewhat confusing because if we're trying to just follow the standards set by one court, we might find ourselves in a situation where another court doesn't agree. And so more than anything, we want you to think about these retirement plan related issues on two different planes or two different levels. So first of all, we know that fiduciary responsibilities are typically thought of as procedural, right? And we talk a lot about, it. it's not about getting the right answer all the time, but it's about trying to get the right answer, putting forth the effort to implement a prudent process so that you can satisfy the duty of prudence. The duty of prudence says that you have to fulfill your responsibilities with the care, the skill, the diligence, and the prudence of one familiar with the matters. But at the same time, if you think about merely looking at the process and not also looking at the end result, you might find yourself in a situation where you've done everything that you're legally required to do but yet you're still not bringing the best possible solutions to your employees. And I would almost argue that even though we know here from federal courts that the fiduciary's duty is the highest known to the law, many of you probably feel an even higher responsibility to your employees. So what we wanna talk about today are the steps we wanna to take to really make three distinct audiences happy. Number one, the federal courts. Number two, the Department of Labor. And number three, perhaps more important than anything else, your people, your employees. So without further ado, I wanna dive into some of this information that we're seeing. I wanna recap for you six recent developments in six different lawsuits. And I think you'll be somewhat amazed at how the analyses and the answers are all over the place. But the one thing for you to keep in mind before we even flip into those is this. You may remember, that there was a United States Supreme Court opinion fairly recently called Hughes versus Northwestern University. And that case got into share classes. It really focused on whether there was a fiduciary breach as a result of the fiduciary's failure to use the cheapest version or the cheapest share class of various investment options. But if you remember, it wasn't that the Supreme Court looked at that and said, you have to use the cheapest. Instead, the Supreme Court was looking at whether the plaintiffs had met their pleading burden so that when the defendants filed what's called a motion to dismiss, the court would say, don't dismiss this case. They've met their pleading burden. Let's proceed into discovery. And if any of you have been involved in litigation, you know that's really where the plaintiffs want to go. They want to get into discovery because that provides them the best leverage to work toward a settlement. So we're going to talk a little bit today about motions to dismiss. And if you're thinking from your company perspective, you're the defendant in this lawsuit, you want to win on the motion to dismiss, right? You want the, the case to be thrown out of court. If you are representing the employees or the plaintiffs, you want to see this motion to dismiss and you want it to fail. You want the court to say no, you have met your pleading burden, let's proceed. So that's a little bit of background as we talk about these cases. So let's talk about one here where it went all the way to trial. The defendants ended up winning at trial in a case involving a fairly large plan, about $790 million in total plan assets and about 6,600 participants. And I've got two slides on this and I wanna focus on the two slides separately. First of all, we had in this situation an argument relating to the prudence of the share classes that were used. And the court in this case, after going all the way through trial, looked at these allegations and as you can see, 
they looked at the committee meeting minutes and they said, we've looked back over six years, 11 different times, you talked about share classes, you talked about or looked at revenue sharing issues, you did your job. And as you work through that snippet that we have below, I'm gonna repeat some of that so that we can really hear out loud what the court said. So the court said, hey, we're gonna look at these investment options. We're gonna look at whether the monitoring and selection process was prudent. So the committee met regularly. So for any of you keeping notes about best practices, number one, have regular meetings. Then the court went on to say, the committee relied on advisors and watch lists to ensure that the plan's investment options were not underperforming, even voting to remove funds that were. Okay, step number two, have a watch list process. That'll come from your investment policy statement. And, and part 2B here is, if you don't have the right people to do that internally, rely on your advisors to perform that function. And then the court went on to say, finally, the committee considered making changes to the plan, such as moving funds to lower fee share classes and adopting CITs, choosing or not choosing to make changes at various times. These findings of fact all support the conclusion that the committee behaved objectively prudent in arriving at its investment decisions. So this right here, I thought this was a wonderful paragraph for any of you who are fiduciaries to say, what are the steps that we ought to be taking? Have meetings, have an investment policy statement, listen to your advisor. If your advisor is a 338 fiduciary, let your advisor make those decisions. And finally, make sure that you're looking at these types of issues on a consistent basis. Now, the other claim that I think caught our eye in this particular case was the argument that the record keeping expenses were way too high. And in this situation, the court said, hey, we looked at your minutes five different times over a five year period. You looked very closely at your record keeping services and your experiences. In fact, you made a change as a result of an extensive RFP process. And the snippet we have below walks through the court's viewpoint on how this committee and how these fiduciaries indeed were acting prudently. So what's the takeaway from this? This court provides for us a nice little roadmap to say, hey, you need to be meeting consistently. You need to look at these issues. You wanna document these issues and where you find results that aren't up to the standard you prescribed, you need to look at making changes. So that's an example of where the defendants were successful at trial with just a judge. Now I wanna talk about where a group of defendants were successful in a jury trial. So this is where the court heard all the evidence, the jury heard all the evidence, they sent it to the jury to consider the various claims that were brought out. And here's the interesting outcome here. You can see this in the bullet point on the left part of this slide. Despite finding that the fiduciaries caused participants to pay unreasonable fees, the jury declined to award damages because they thought that the planned fiduciaries were prudent in their processes. And so some of you have probably seen like jury questionnaires over here on the right. And this is actually a snippet of what the jury filled out. So the first question was, have the plaintiffs, those are the participants, proven by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendants, the fiduciaries, breached their duty of prudence by allowing unreasonable record keeping and administrative fees to be charged? The answer was yes. So you see that and you think, oh, well, that's a fiduciary breach, right? Because they paid unreasonable expenses. And in fact, moving to the next one, B, have the plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant's breach of fiduciary duty resulted in a loss to the plan? The answer was yes. So if you're the defendant and you're reading through this and you see question A, question B, you're thinking, uh-oh, what's that number gonna look like at the end? And look what the jury did. The jury said, you fiduciaries, caused loss, we're not going to hold you responsible for any loss because you had such prudent procedures in place. So remember what I said up front about satisfying courts may not always be best for your employees. Well, this is one where the defendants, the fiduciaries were able to get away by just satisfying the court or satisfying the jury. So above all else, we need to remind ourselves that the procedural responsibilities will always come first. And in this situation, strong procedures save them from liability. Now, here's another interesting example. And I'm gonna show you three court cases that shook out so far in a very different order or very different results than what you might find. So this is one called Matea v. Cook Group. And in this situation, there was an argument that the record keeping fees were too expensive. 
And the court said in ruling that in fact, they were going to dismiss the case and grant the defendant's motion to dismiss. They really focused on the need in that pleading to identify similar plans that offered the same services for less. And you look at that second bullet point, the plaintiff must allege which services each other plan provided and plead facts indicating that the fees were excessive relative to the services rendered. So in this situation, the plaintiffs provided this chart. Look over at the chart, look down at this particular plan. You can see that the total record keeping fee was $64. Look at all the other numbers in that column. None of those other numbers are even close to $64. It's very abundantly clear that these employees were paying far more than what the employees were paying in any of the other plans. And you know what the court said? All you did is focus on price. Plaintiffs, you didn't come in and say that not only was it too expensive, but all the services were the same. So as a result of that, we're gonna dismiss this. That's not enough to state a claim. So that's helpful for you to keep in mind that the requirement is not that you be cheap. The requirement is not that you be the cheapest or that you choose the cheapest. The requirement really relates to value. And what the court said in this case is you didn't even get to value because you didn't say that all of the services are the same and you were paying twice as much. And somewhat similarly, in this case up in Michigan, the court looked at an even longer list of rival plans or similarly sized plans and said, hey, you can't just say that all these mega plans can negotiate the same fees without pointing out that the services are the same. So look at that chart on the right. Look at all the work that they put into pulling that together. Think about how many Form 5500s they went out and looked at, looked at the assets, figured out what the fees are, ran the numbers, and showed and highlighted that the cost of this plan was roughly twice, if not more than twice as expensive as any other plan on the list. And what did the court do? The court said, we're going to dismiss this case because you haven't really gotten into pleading on the value. You haven't gotten to the services that were provided. Okay, so I'm looking at these two cases and I'm thinking, well, here we've got 11 or 12 comparison plans and gosh, that wasn't enough to keep the, the case alive. And I go to this one, I say there's 15 and that's not enough to keep the case alive. And then I get to this one where four comparative plans were enough. Well, how do we make sense of any of that? It, the reality is that different courts are looking at these issues differently. And what the court said here is that there are pretty good arguments that record keeping expenses are commoditized, they're fungible. The market's really competitive for those. You're getting essentially the same services from all these record keepers. So if you walk in and say that this plan was paying twice as much, three times as much, four times as much, that's probably grounds to dismiss a claim. That's what the court said in this situation, that we're not going to dismiss this. You've done what you need to do to survive in this particular situation. So what does that mean to all of you? I'd say above all else, we just looked at three different cases with different outcomes. Shouldn't we really be asking ourselves without regard to potential liability, have we done the best for your employees if they're currently paying two times or three times or four times the market average? I contend that the answer there is no. And then finally, I just wanna highlight very briefly a case where the plaintiffs also won on a motion to dismiss. And this is where there was a strong push to use the lowest share class. And the defendants came in and said, well, we were using a more expensive version because we like the revenue share. And that's a good reason for us to have a more expensive version. And that we use that record keep or that revenue sharing well, and so you should dismiss the case. And here's what the court said. It would be inappropriate to resolve these issues at the motion to dismiss stage. So we have an example here of where the court said, you might have a good reason for what you're doing, but we're gonna settle that in discovery, not going to settle that right now. And so this is a case that's going to continue where the defendant decided that they wanted to use revenue sharing. And essentially the court said, well, there could be a cost to that and that you might have to endure discovery. So to wrap up our thoughts today, on this and as you might imagine we could probably talk about these six cases for a couple of hours but 15 minutes seems like a better amount of time i would just ask you this do your employees care only about procedure so if you are on the left side of this and you're working with an organization where the red 
fonted plan is yours or you're in the right hand side of this and the red fonted plan is yours how do you explain to your employees why those numbers are outliers maybe you can maybe you could look at the record keeping services you're receiving and say we are with this record keeper that provides services that are unavailable anywhere else if that's the case then maybe your employees would say okay we're getting something of value but I assure you that they don't care only about procedure. They really want to know about the numbers. And so that's why, if many of you read our newsletter for this month, we quoted Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. So at its core, ERISA says you've got to try. You have to have procedures in place. But for your employees, they want you to do it right too, not just try. So thanks again for joining us today. We've got a couple of upcoming webinars. Um, our Fit for Learning webinar later this month, where our Financial Fitness for Life team will be talking about investments. This is a really good opportunity for your employees to get some investment 101 education to help them understand how different investments work. And then we'll have a market-specific webinar early next month in October. If you've got any questions at all, please reach out. Um, I know we went through a lot really quickly today, but we wanna provide for you this high-level picture that your responsibilities as a fiduciary are truly procedural in nature, but at their core, you wanna get that answer as right as you can for your people. If you got any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.